Hi there. Welcome to On the Flip Side, a podcast for anyone who wants to live their best sales life. We're going to be talking to buyers, sales managers, SDRs and AEs about things like what does it take to be a great sales manager or how can you go home happy month after month. So let's dive right in. Hi folks. Welcome to another episode of On the Flip Side with Wingman. I'm Kushal and today we're joined by someone who's pretty much synonymous with mental health and sales. Jeff, so excited you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, happy to be happy to be here, Kishal. I'm, I'm really looking forward to a little bit of a discussion around mental health and sales, and hopefully get into some tactical strategies and conversation here. So it should be good. Great. Now, Jeff, I know everyone kind of knows who you are in sales, so I'm just going to skip the introduction for now, maybe, and mm-hmm. just kind of get straight to it. One of the things that I like to ask people is, you know, what's the first thing that you ever sold? First thing I ever sold would probably be so when I was in university, I make some extra extra cash. I was working as a as, as someone in a call center as part of McGill University to help kind of get alumni to donate to the university. So I'd say that was kind of like the first real sales job. But when I think about where my my career actually started, it was actually not too far from you. I was doing some traveling through Southeast Asia and ended up in in Melbourne down in Australia for a little bit. And I started selling Australian farm products to Australian people over the phone. So that would be the the first one, which was my introduction to the calling, the negotiating, the objection handling. So everything you think about sales would, 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 have, would have started there. Got it. So what's maybe the one thing that that experience that first job taught you? I think something that you didn't think that you didn't expect. Yeah, like I think that was like a really good introduction to how important things like tone and pace were on the phone in terms of being able to sound confident, sound knowledgeable at the product. It really kind of sparked my interest in sales. And when I got back from Australia, I started working at a, a pretty intense sales organization. It was, it was called World Trade Group. And I was being measured on whether or not I could make $200 a day, two and a half hours of talk time. And that was definitely a very intense sales environment where sort of the, I think what I learned there was how important the, the mental game and mental health became to being able to perform and, and show up your best each day. But here's a related question, right? We know you're passionate about improving mental health and talking about mental health and the impact on sales performance. Why this specifically? You know, what's why you're interested in this personally? What's the story there? What's the starting point? Yeah, like I think sort of that 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 sort of that situation that I was talking about, sort of that more intense sales environment that I found myself working in, it became just a huge focus of mine because I started to struggle with my own mental health. I had really bad anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, and it really started to impact me on an ongoing basis. And it, it was actually kind of like the third panic attack that put me in the hospital in the middle of the night when I thought, look, like what's what's going on here? Like, this is like really serious. This is not a healthy way to live. And I went to see my doctor who prescribed me some anxiety medication, which I tried for two to three months. I, I really hated how it made me feel. And going to through therapy 10 years ago was still highly stigmatized. And that's when it kind of really became important for me to say, look, like, you know, if I want to keep working in sales and, and maintain this career, I need to figure out, you know, what was going on? What's the mental health story here? How does the brain react under stress? What are all the different things that you can be doing on an ongoing basis to take care of yourself, regulate your stress levels so you can perform your best? and the more I went down this path, the more I started to realize that, like, like, look, anxiety in sales is not optional. It's part of everyday life. And I've yet to see meet a salesperson or a sales leader that hasn't struggled with their mental health at some point during their sales career, even if it's just minor anxiety or minor depression or even minor anger on an ongoing basis. So, yeah, it's just like there's it's so stigmatized, but it has such an impact on our performance that uh, that we really need to start prioritizing this conversation if we want to start achieving peak levels of sales performance. Thanks for sharing that, Jeff. Yeah, I think what you've kind of put across in a few lines, you know, there's so much more there and there's obviously such a journey to be done in that. And you're right when you're talking about how all of this could have, you know, there would have been a lot of stigma around it. There still is in some parts. So I guess one of my next questions for you is, you know, you talk about how doing meaningful work is important for mental health and sales success, right? Around doing work that has meaning. So the question is really, how can you make your work more meaningful? You know, whatever that means for a salesperson at whatever level they are at. Meaningful work is 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 absolutely critical to 
to, to resilience, like all of the kind of research around this this topic. There's a really cool company based here in 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 Canada, in, in Winnipeg, Brivia Consulting. They do a lot of work around how important finding more meaning is in, in your day to day to being able to push through and face some of the stressors and, and overcome the stressors that we face on an ongoing basis. Because when we're emotionally connected to our work, it allows us to become more engaged and become more resilient and and kind of reconnect with a deeper purpose than simply serving ourselves. So when it comes to building more meaning and developing more meaningful career on an ongoing basis, it's it's really important to start disconnecting from the outcomes within sales, which is heavily focused, sort of that extrinsic motivation and start fueling ways and looking for ways to become more intrinsically motivated. And one of the best ways you can do that is to start revisiting your purpose and your personal why each day. Like, why are you showing up in sales on an ongoing basis? And the key thing here is your purpose has to have three components. It has to be, and this is based off of work by Dr. Michael Gervais. He's like a high performance psychologist and works with top 100 CEOs and like athletes in high stress situations. And what he says is your purpose to have a strong one, it needs to be future oriented. So you need to have a vision and a, and, and a goal of like who you're trying to become. Two, it has to be meaningful and, and important to you on an ongoing basis. And three, which is the one where a lot of salespeople fall short, is it needs to be bigger than yourself. I'm not sure about sort of the salespeople that you've worked with, Fischel, but I know a lot of salespeople, especially early on in my career, I was only in it for the money. I was only in it for the, the life outside of work. I was only in it for myself. And I was only doing these things to serve myself. And as a result, that's a very weak purpose. It's a very weak way. Like it's not going to protect you from those stressors that we face on an ongoing basis. And a better way to do that is to really start to adopt more of an altruistic mindset or a servant mindset where you're showing up each and every day to try and help and better the lives of the people around you, whether it's colleagues in your team, your friends and family, but more importantly, serving your customers and the, the, the people that you're selling to on an ongoing basis, trying to genuinely make an, an, an impact in improving their life is a much deeper way to connect with your purpose on an ongoing basis. So there's lots of different strategies that you can use to, to do that. There's something that I would recommend people Google, or you can search on sales health lines. You can just kind of type in job crafting. This is a really good practice and a really good exercise that Yale psychologist Amy Wozniacki developed to help people find more meaning in their day to day, and it's essentially a way to have that, that'll walk you through. It's an exercise that walks you through how you change your perspective on each of the different tasks that you're doing on on an, each day within sales to find more meaning, to connect with a deeper deeper purpose and a personal why, so that you can find that bigger purpose and and to become more resilient to the stresses that you're facing. So it sounds like what could really help us to kind of think as sales beyond the numbers and the targets and the quotas and really kind of try and find meaning and personal connection with maybe the larger purpose that you're working towards. How easy or difficult is this to sell to salespeople? Like I think there's, it, it, it can be a difficult shift. Like I've definitely delivered talks and trainings and there's definitely the odd kind of salesperson or the, or, or the occasional sales leader that says like, that's silly. Like that's not, that's not like something that we should ever do. Like I'm in it for the money. And my, and my comment to them is like, look, like I'm not saying that, you know, in being in it for the money, if you were deeply connected to that kind of, that kind of approach, if that's meaningful to you, that's amazing. But what's going to happen is when you start taking a different mindset and changing your perspective to be focused entirely on serving the buyer and serving the customer, like that's going to, bring you more purpose, more meaning, but it's also going to make you more a more authentic person, a more genuine person, you're gonna become easier to trust. So you're actually going to make more money and achieve all of these career and personal goals that you have anyways, when you adopt this altruistic and servant mindset. And if you think about it, like, I just think about it for myself. And as I work on sales health lines, like I'm a solo entrepreneur, there's lots of stressors on an ongoing basis when you're trying to build and manage a business from scratch. Like I'm not perfect. There's days when I'm not motivated. There's days when I don't feel like I want to work and that I want to quit and I want to give up like many salespeople face and on their day to day. And for me, it's not like pushing through this, especially when you're working on your own, like many salespeople are doing right now, working from home. What's getting me out of bed isn't thinking about 
you know, how much money is, can I make the company or what is building sales health plans going to mean to my career on those really challenging days? That's not meaningful. That's not purposeful, but what gets me going, what gets me moving on those days is visualizing a salesperson who might be struggling with anxiety, who might be going the same, uh, going through panic attacks or struggling with insomnia, like the same situations that I went through and just reflecting and thinking back on how tough and challenging a time that, that was for myself and my life and how alone I felt. It's showing up for those people every single day and thinking about those people that I'm trying to help that gets me moving, that gets me out of bed. And it's that deeper purpose and meaning that I'm connecting with to find that resilience on a daily basis on those days when my motivation is slipping and I am feeling a little anxious or a little stressed out. And that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, money is great. And, you know, these individual motivators are great. But when you can really connect and think about and put yourself in your buyer's shoes, I don't care if you're selling paper clips or you're selling like a mental health solution. All of these things can be perceived as extremely meaningful when you start thinking about the customer, maybe the buyer who's, think we use paper clips, for example, think about the buyer who's disorganized, has desks all over their, all over their, has paper all over their desk and they don't know where to go. Like they're, they're trying to prepare for a good meeting. And then all of a sudden you present them with a solution where there's a paper clip that will help them organize. And if you just think about how beneficial that tiny little paper clip is to someone who's disorganized and might get fired or feels like they, they're going to lose their job. Like, that's what I mean, like spending that time connecting with those emotions, getting in tune with how those buyers are feeling on an ongoing basis is, is critical to resilience and motivation and, and keeping your mental health in a good place to, to perform under stress. So I was going to ask you about, you know, what do people do who maybe feel like they're not in a job where, where it's not so easy to see meaning, right? For instance, they're not out to kind of improve mental health for people. But yeah, I think you just kind of answered that with someone selling paper clips kind of expand on that a little further like i think there's there's a lot of fake empathy going around within sales or a lot of people a lot of sales leaders and sales people are preaching on linkedin or preaching to their teams like you have to be empathetic you have to be empathetic to your teams but no one has really done a great job saying here's what empathy actually is so if you think about empathy it really has two components first there's something called cognitive empathy so it's being able to think about someone that you're speaking to. So take a customer or buyer and being able to think about potential challenges that they're facing in their job. Now, salespeople are really, really good at that. They're really good at sort of thinking about those challenges and uncovering those pain points. But it's manipulative if you just go stay, stay at that level and then throw those challenges and those problems and back at the buyer. The second part of empathy, which a lot of people miss, is something called effective empathy. And this was outlined by Scott Barry Kaufman in his book, Transcend. Effective empathy is when you actually connect with the emotions and feel those emotions that that person is going through. So if someone is struggling with, like if we use this paperclip example, as sort of a very simplistic approach. If we think about, oh yeah, I can tell when that person is, doesn't have a paperclip and they feel disorganized and they feel disorganized. Like I get that. You want to take it that next step and actually sit there and be like, feel that disorganization, disorganization, feel those emotions that that person is feeling, because that's going to help you really understand what they're feeling and truly become empathetic so that you can connect, relate to, and really serve them and as best as you possibly can to find that solution that's going to match their needs as much as possible. So yeah, like that's what I, that's what I mean. Like it's like really, really important to not just use that cognitive empathy you really connect with that effective empathy where you're feeling what your buyers are feeling on an ongoing basis do you think it's really possible for someone who's not that empathetic to develop that over time or do you think it's more of an innate trait i'm it, biased no like it's it can fully be developed like there's like it really requires like that's the nice thing about about sort of the neuroplasticity of the brain that's really been studied and, and, and talked about consistently through things like growth mindset and Carol Dweck's work on, on resilience and all of the neuroscience research that's coming out right now. Like it's really, really exciting to see that humans are essentially one of the only mammals on the planet that up until pretty much the, the, the day we die, we have control over changing the structure of our brain and learning new skills and growing and developing parts of the area that are impacting us on an ongoing basis. 
and things like EQ, like that's why EQ is such an, a, an important topic to, and a, an important area for sales teams to focus on. It's you can develop these, these skills to be able to become more empathetic, more authentic, more trusting, more emotionally secure in how you're presenting yourself because of this neuroplasticity, because the brain is able to grow and develop through learning, through practice, through discipline. But that's the tough part. Like I think a lot of us within sales, just in society in general, we're conditioned to, to think that, you know, we can take a, a, a magic pill or we are chasing this instant gratification where we meditate once and we're all of a sudden supposed to feel better. Or we kind of, you know, learn about effective empathy and we try it on one call and it doesn't work. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, like this doesn't work. It's no, like the thing that all of us miss in, on, on a, within our day to day is that discipline and that practice to really commit to the process, put the work in every single day to start developing these skills, to use that neuroplasticity, because it's not going to change overnight. But if you commit to the process and practice it, the returns on resilience, sales performance, mental health, or insane it's it's incredible i think that's a super useful reminder for everyone that you know a lot of these concepts that we tend to read and maybe apply once they don't really work so much unless it becomes a matter of habit and practice really whether that's meditation or anything else i will personally attest to that as yeah. well yeah like that's, that's super important but that's why that's why even something simple is something i, I think a lot of us are are just really bad learners to, and it's it's really hard to retain information. So that's why I really love using things like LinkedIn or writing articles for Sales Health Alliance is because the it, it really forces you to digest and and really kind of reflect and change your opinion to apply like a different a specific concept to sales and mental health. So when I'm thinking of, when I'm reading a book I'm reading about sort of 10 to 15 pages of a time. After those 10 to 15 pages, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking about, I'm reflecting, and I'm using LinkedIn as a way to hopefully teach something valuable to my network or using an article on LinkedIn or a video or some or a podcast like this. How do I teach something based off what I learned? And it's that teaching process that really helps me absorb and learn and, and, and retain a lot of this information that allows me to keep leveling up, leveling up. So. That's one of the things that I practice on a daily basis. How do I become a good a good learner? How do I kind of retain and 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 use a lot of the stuff that I'm learning on a daily basis to store it to a deeper part of my brain that I can remember it as opposed to just reading something and forgetting about it? I think that's a powerful way to do it, really, right? To kind of to become a better learner, or while you're trying to become a better learner, to maybe teach things along the way because yeah. then you're listening to it yourself, you're processing it, and then you're listening to it, and then you're engaging with others too. So hopefully yeah. it becomes like a shared behavior. If 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 someone wants to kind of like remember a, I guess an acronym, I think they're called acronyms. The the acronym that I use is RAT. It doesn't sound very pleasant, but it's R A T T. So you read it, you apply what you learned to something that you're that you're working on. So I always apply it to the idea of mental health and sales. You try it. So you try it yourself. Whatever you've learned, you, you try it to see does this actually kind of what is what is it what does it feel like how do you how do you experience it and t and the last t stands for teach it you teach it to someone else and i found that's a really good sort of framework and process to really level up and and retain and learn and and, and teach people effectively i think that's yeah that's super useful and powerful for everyone to sort of try out i was reading up a bit on your you know one of these articles on sales health um alliance and i was reading through some of the research and you know, talked about how some entry level roles such as SDRs and BDRs face maybe more mental health issues than others, right? So there's really a two part question here. One is, of course, what can sales leaders and managers then do in this context to make work kind of less stressful for those at entry roles, right? Where you typically don't have that much power in the org. And also then whose responsibility is it really? Because then ultimately our own mental health is really in our own hands. So how do you kind of figure those two things out? Yeah, so I think just speaking off of my own experience and in, in the conversations I've had, like I think one of the biggest things we have to understand is society in general, whether it's our parents, whether it's our schooling, the, the education system, like it's done a terrible, terrible job providing us with tactics and strategies to help us manage our mental health and regulate our stress levels on an ongoing basis. It's just something that doesn't get discussed. And if you think about sort of growing up, you know, you might experience a little bit of heartbreak when your crush breaks up with you in, in high school. 
you might experience a little bit of stress or, or behind that sort of exam that you're taking in university and you think you might fail, but all of these things happen and they're, they're over with, like they're, they're set there. There's a set period of time to give that body time to recover and, and, and learn from it. The thing about sales is when you start working in sales, you're thrown into this environment where you're facing extremely difficult emotions every single day and have no training and no ability and, and no skill set to really be able to navigate them. You're dealing with things like intense anger, intense fear, anxiety, loneliness, sometimes jealousy. Sometimes you're 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 feeling like disappointed. All of these emotions. It's just this is this, this intense wave, and all of these things get bundled together when you don't have it have any kind of skill sets and strategies to be able to navigate them on an ongoing basis. So one of the best things that sales teams and sales organizations can do is stop assuming that the people that you're hiring, especially fresh graduates, know how to manage their stress levels and know how to manage their emotions and know how to manage their mental health because they don't. And that's why it's so, so important if you're hiring people and putting them into these high stress environments where they're totally unprepared from a from a from a mental health standpoint to navigate this stress, you really have to be starting that conversation and providing that training from day one. So something that I always recommend is you likely have your product training, your standard sales training and coaching that help people learn how to negotiate and objection handle and influence people. But what you're missing is you're missing that that resilience, that EQ and that mental health training that should be part of every single onboarding process going forward so that you're equipping your salespeople with the pads and the helmets they need to play that contact sport each day and protect their mental game and protect their mental health. So that's step one. It's like starting and providing the skill set from, from day one. And I've developed an online program to help sales teams do this. But then you're right. The other side of the coin is there really needs to be a lot of accountability at an individual standpoint. There, there needs to be, you know, you can provide training but it really requires accountability for the individual to start practicing, to have the discipline, to start using these things. And I think leaders and managers can hold people on their team accountable to, you know, helping them regulate their stress and, and then implementing some of these, these, these strategies that they can use. But you're right. Ultimately, it comes down to the individual to say, look, like, if I want to be a corporate athlete, if I want to be, perform my best and I want to, you know, achieve all of these great things that, and these goals that I've set out in my life, like the most important thing that we need to focus on is protecting our mind. And that requires daily practice, similar to going to the gym to get stronger and lifting weights and exercising. You need to apply that same mindset to putting in that practice from a mindset, from a mental health, from a resilience standpoint to ensure that you're developing and strengthening your mind to perform your best each day. I think that adding that component of, you know, mental health training in that sense, mental health strength training, I think would really be super powerful for teams of all types, right? Not just sales types, not just sales teams. I know that we think of um, sales, of course, as a stressful um, profession, which it is, right? Because, you know, you're talking with people live and they're volatile and there's really no control over someone else's behavior. But yeah, I can see how that would apply to different types of roles, professions and teams, really, and how I think that should become a necessary um, part of the corporate curriculum, so to speak. What sort of reception does your idea get, Jeff? Is this something that people have accepted now? Do you think it's going to become a standard practice across teams? Is there a ge geographical divide also on this? So I, I actually don't have too much insight into whether it's a geographical divide. I, 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 I need to sort of start collecting more data on, on, that, on that sort of approach. But when I did a survey back in December of 2019. So kind of right before COVID really kicked off, I found that more than two in five salespeople struggle with their mental health. So I found that 43% of salespeople were, were struggling and there's a really strong correlation between mental health and sales performance. And then I partnered with Uncrushed. They're another amazing mental health organization and Richard Harris from the Harris Consulting Group on a, on a more recent survey to kind of test the waters again. And on this survey, we had 770 salespeople respond and we found was back in May, the, the number has now jumped to 58% of salespeople are now struggling with their mental health. So almost like three in five, which is crazy for frontline sales roles and frontline sales managers, it is above that three and five number more around kind of 62, 63%, which is insane to think like that means that potentially 60 over 60% of your sales organization or specific teams are not performing optimally. So 
the data is really kind of piling up and it's becoming more and more apparent that look like the more you ignore this problem, like it's having a direct impact on your sales performance, your team sales performance. So for sure, there's going to be organizations that continue to ignore the conversation that continue to ignore the topic, but they're really going to be left behind, especially because the pandemic has really brought this conversation of mental health to the forefront of organizations. And this is becoming a, not a, you know, maybe we provide it, maybe we don't, it's becoming more of a, if I'm a top salesperson, I'm looking for a job. This is one of my top priorities that I, that I want to make sure is being met by the organization. The other way that I'd sort of like to like to kind of position this is it's is it's really just a critical part. Like if you think about sort of the mental mistakes that are being made by salespeople on an ongoing basis, like you need to start, like I said, going back to providing that training, to providing that resilience training when people come into the organization to help them navigate the unique stressors. And we can't just be relying on HR to provide solutions to provide tactics because HR doesn't really get what it's like to work in sales. It's really the sales leader that has those experiences and knows or the reps that are having those experiences. We need to start putting mental health solutions and strategies and tactics in the context of sales. So people know, okay, when I face rejection, here's what I can actually do rather than say, oh, well, we're taking care of our mental health, mental health. Here's a meditation app that we buy and people be like, Okay, like I know meditation works, but I don't know when to use it. So it really requires leaders to 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 become more educated, become more informed on this topic, and start start kind of putting these strategies and these tactics in the context of sales specifically. And are you seeing sales leaders kind of becoming more empathetic and more open towards this need now? I think so. I think so. Like I think again, I think the I was pre pandemic, so I've been talking about this for two and a half years now, I think pre pandemic, I was a little ahead of the curve. And people were like, who's this crazy guy talking about mental health and sales. And it was tough, like it was challenging. And, and organizations were kind of like, yeah, we get it. But I think what this pandemic has really done is it's really, like I said, brought this mental health conversation to the forefront of organizations, specifically because sales leaders have had to or are experiencing more so now their own struggles with mental health from working from home going through these kind of this really crazy chaotic time like they're feeling it like i think sometimes what tends to happen is you get promoted to 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 management position and i'm not saying that managers don't struggle with their mental health but the data is showing that we've collected it is showing that they struggle less than frontline salespeople, and i think that tends to happen you get promoted to manager and then all of a sudden you kind of you know, a couple months go by and you start to lose touch of what it's like, what it's actually like to be working and grinding in sales every single day. But I think that's what this pandemic has really done is it's like, it's really impacted the executives and the leaders that are now saying, oh crap, like, I, I can't tell you how many salespeople, sales leaders I've spoken to that have said, well, if I'm feeling it, I know my team is feeling it. That's been a very common sentiment is that sales leaders are really feeling it now. And they're all of a sudden being like, well, then my team has to be feeling it. So I need to start doing something. So it is becoming more approachable and more of a topic, but still way more work and, and definitely not at the rate that needs to be addressed. So, yeah. So I, I can see from some of your research that, you know, if we think of sales events as triggers, and I think from some of your research, micromanagement appears to be one of the top triggers, especially for sales reps. I'm just wondering what are those triggers that you think are maybe that appear to be common across job titles and levels in sales? Yeah, micromanagement is a, is a huge one. I think sort of the, I, I think if we were kind of like to encompass a lot of the the stressors or a lot of the, the, the triggers, I think a lot of it kind of roots back to connecting to psychological safety within sales. Like a lot of the things like when, a, a lot of the way sales is structured or some of the management best practices or quote unquote management best practices that are being used within sales, a lot of that really impacts and takes away from psychological safety. So if I were to give an example, um, let's say like salespeople or sales leaders love to use competition. And there's this really weird kind of misconception that the best way to motivate people is for salespeople to compete against each other. And we want to motivate people through competition. And, then, and, and it's, it's, it's totally misplaced if you start looking at sort of the 
the, the, the research behind a lot of this, this, this stuff. And also the way I look at this is if you think about sort of a basketball team, like the LA Lakers is a basketball team that a lot of people will know. If you have LeBron James and you have Anthony Davis and you have like Caldwell Pope and you have a manager that says, LeBron, I want you to get 25 points. Anthony Davis, you have to get 20 points. Caldwell Pope, you get 18 points. And if you don't get that, you're you're going to be traded to another team or you're going to get fired. Those teams, when the, when pressure is on the line and the, we're close to the end of the game, if someone's behind their quote unquote target or their points, they're not going to make the right pass. They're not going to put the team ahead of themselves. And within sales, like that self-serving, that individualistic mindset of hitting people on the same team against each other is just fueling this toxicity, fueling this lack of safety that someone feels. And it's really hindering the ability for someone to say, hey, I'm struggling right now. I need some help on this problem. And when you shut down that 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 first instinct that all humans have to ask for help when they're facing stress and, 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 and a challenging situation, this is backed up by neuroses, neuroscience, when you shut down that first in, instinct to act for, ask for help, you automatically start putting that person in a position where they feel like they need to fight or flight. And those stress hormones start running through their body. And a lot of this really just comes back to psychological safety. Like we need to make sure that people feel safe. They have job security. They feel comfortable asking for help. They're supportive leadership. I'm posting an article later today that's kind of going to show a lot of the research on this. So yeah, I think fundamentally, just the way sales is structured and some of these like dated processes, they're, they're, they're just not rooted in science and not really effective. So we need to kind of address them as, a, as, a, as an industry together. It sure sounds like there's a lot of work for sales um, teams and really managers to do when it comes to maybe coaching their teams in the best way. And also maybe just a shout out here to I think one of your LinkedIn posts where you talked about how a lot of the ways that we celebrate sales and sales success is sort of outdated, like mm -hmm. coffee, clo coffee for closers, right? Or a lot of those really models are sort of outdated today. Yeah, like I think you're I think you're totally right. Like it's like it's 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 really unfortunate, right? Like there's like if you think about if you're a brand new salesperson and you think about, oh, I'm gonna get into sales, and you think about the role models that you have from like a boiler room, from a Wolf of Wall Street, from a Glenn Garrigan Ross, all of these role models really depict someone who's like narcissistic, who's taking advantage of people, who's living this lifestyle that's really damaging to their overall health and well-being and sacrificing extremely meaningful parts of their life, whether it's their family and their friends to get ahead. And it's really sad that that salespeople just don't really have these pop culture icons and and role models to to look up to and 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 to and to think of. And yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. Like I think one of the the things that I've I've noticed is like I'm a huge superhero nerd. And I love superheroes. I love all the Mar Marvel movies. Like I, I watched them entirely. And I never really understood like why Black Panther, for example, was such like a pivotal movie that did so well. And the more I started to kind of dig into it and see posts about this, and it was really interesting to see that it's because I had this blind spot in my head where all the superheroes that I was looking up to, all of these like role models that I'd use were like the Captain Americas and, you know, white superheroes that I was like, ooh, like I, I can be like them. And it was really interesting to see once Black Panther came out, like all of the different kind of people of color and like African Americans that were like, had this role model now, this superhero that they could then dress up with and be this inspiration and this person that they would like help save the world that kind of looked like them and they could relate to. And I kind of apply that very similarly to to sales in general in this pop culture 90s sales. It's like we don't have these role models that salespeople can show up and learn from and be like, oh, that's what it that's what it means to be like an authentic salesperson really is making a difference in the world for the right reason and not just in it for themselves. Yeah, I can see how, yeah, I think sales and even otherwise, I think the world really does need better role models who are yeah. probably more indicative of all types of people. Yeah, for 100%. sure. Here's another question, right? So I know that, of course, mental health is a long game, right? Improving it is, it requires study, patience, habits, all of these things take time. But if, you know, if, someone wants to get started today, what do you really think from a tactical perspective or maybe things that, so whoever's listening to this podcast, if they're like, okay, you know what, I want to start working on this and I can see how it's impacting my performance. 
maybe if you could list down a few things that you think they should absolutely get started with. Yeah, so I think I think the the biggest thing is 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 awareness. Like I think the awareness piece is is, is huge. Like all of us will be will be I guess mental health impacts each and every person differently and different stressors based off how we're raised, our environments will impact some people more than others. And it's really, you know, looking inward and becoming more aware of what mental health actually means to us, because a lot of people kind of misperceive mental health as me mental illness. And me me really what mental health is, is a spectrum of well-being. Mental illness is on one of that kind of one of the polar ends where really bad anxiety, insomnia, really bad dep depression, bipolar. And there's a lot of stigma to be like, oh, like if I don't have those things, then I'm okay with my mental health. Like, I don't need to worry about that, which isn't, it couldn't be further from the truth. Like you're, everyone listening to this is on that spectrum of well-being. Some might just be performing better or th than others. Some might be, if you think about physical health, some are more physically healthy than others. So ultimately what you want to start doing is building awareness of like, where are you falling on that spectrum on a daily basis? And what types of things move you down that spectrum and, and impact you more than others? So becoming aware of your stressors in your, in your environment and that, that, are, that are impacting you the most. And then the other thing you want to start looking at is like, what does declining mental health feel like in your own body? So you want to think about, there's really four buckets to think about. There's intrusive thoughts. So how does your thinking change when you encounter a stressor? What do you start thinking about? What do you start kind of worrying about? What if statements is a big kind of sim symbol of like, what if I get fired? What if this happens? That's a big thing. Then you want to start building awareness around your emotions, working on your emotional literacy. How does declining mental health feel like? What does it feel like in your own body? Do you become, start to feel lonely? Do you start to get really angry and upset? So what do those, what's that emotional change look like? Three is you want to start looking at sort of the somatic symptoms. This is where like a body scan meditation on a daily basis can really help because you want to start learning about how your body is holding stress. Where does your body kind of feel physically like out of whack? Like for me, I always get this pain in the upper right side of my stomach. I start having night sweats in the middle of the night. So I know when those things are happening to me that there are things that I need to start kind of addressing in my personal life. I'm not balanced at work. I need to kind of prioritize more self-care. But it's because I did the work to learn that those are what those things mean to me, that I'm not taking care of my mental health. And then the last thing is like habits, like what habits and routines, start auditing them, like what habits and routines are you, do you typically do when you start to get stressed out? And maybe it's having an extra drink after work, or maybe it's you skip going to the gym multiple times in a row. Maybe it's you can't fall asleep at night, or maybe you're scrolling more on social media than you should be. Like all of these habits and routines change. So the first step, I always recommend is like building that awareness, like building that awareness of what mental health actually means to you at an individual level. And that's where I've kind of built like the online course that I just launched to really help people step one, build that awareness by, you know, learning more about these things. But two, then what are the tactical strategies you can do to start managing your and regulating your stress levels on an ongoing basis that are rooted in things like neuroscience, physiology, and positive psychology that you can start doing on a daily basis to protect your mental health and keep you from fluctuating up and down the spectrum too much in response to the stressors that you're facing. So a bit of a long-winded answer, but I hope that's a, a good starting place for people. I think that definitely is. And I think interestingly enough for me, I know I'm slightly nervous on a podcast recording when my neck starts to get a little stiff on one mm. side. Mm. <laughs> so that immediately tells me, okay, you know what, Vishal, I think you're a little a little nervous about the recording and you need to relax. So I think it's really important to kind of listen, like you said, to your own body and what it's trying to tell you, right? I, um, I, I, I one, one last thing I would, would add as well is it's, there's, we also have to, just as a whole, change this perspective that I think a lot of us kind of perceive stress as a negative when stress is very positive. We use stress for growth, whether it's physically and or mentally. Stressful situations is something that, like, like I said, is 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 the fuel for growth. So I think it's also really important to start changing that perspective when you're feeling that sort of pain on the side of your neck before a podcast. Sort of use that as your spidey sense. It starts to tell you that, like, hey, I'm about to do something really exciting and nervous and something that's outside my comfort zone, but this is also like a, something meaningful and it's going to help me grow. So that's kind of helped me as well as really changing that perspective behind things that make me scared. It's like, you no, know, like I want to start trying to seek out that discomfort on a regular basis because the recipes for, for growth when used in a healthy way.
Yeah, I think that's an incredibly useful point. I think the problem with a lot of us is that we don't want to sit with these uncomfortable emotions, right? We don't want to think mm. those thoughts or even if they happen to us, we just want them to kind of, you know, run away and mm. we don't really want to sit and uh, be uncomfortable with them. But I think that there's from my own experiences as well. I think there's really no way to kind of get through them besides sitting with them for a while. Yeah, but that's that's what that's where sort of training and and coaching on mental health and resilience can really help because if you have if you don't have the knowledge or don't know how to sit with emotions or you don't know, you know, what's good, what's bad, how to navigate it, it's an extremely terrifying experience and the mo- most people will want to avoid it. Like I know in my in my early career before I started learning about this stuff, like that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to avoid it by playing video games or partying too much. So that's really where that benefit from mental health and resilience and doing that inner work really comes because it gives you the strategies, and the tactics so that you can sit with those emotions in a healthy way to learn from them and grow from them rather than be something that you're afraid of on a, on a regular basis that continues to hold you back. I think everyone's at this point kind of sold on the importance of mental health, <laughs> uh, especially when it comes to their sales performance and otherwise as well. So I think we'd love to, you know, maybe just tell us, Jeff, what are the different programs that you sort of run and what can people really reach out to you for? And yeah, if you could tell us more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So Sales Health Alliance is sort of the, the company that I built to to help sort of start addressing this, empowering sales people and sales teams to start reaching peak levels of sales performance and resilience through better mental health. So you can check out the website, saleshealthalliance.com. I built it to be a resource first and a business second. So there's over a hundred pieces of content on there for people. If you're, if this is a new topic to you, you can start exploring things like mindset and different perspectives around mental health and sales to start educating yourself. And then if you want to start taking that next step to say, okay, like, this is cool. Like I, I get it. And you want to start sort of actioning some of the, the the things that that i've that i've shared on this call and start practicing them in a more structured way then i'd recommend sort of checking out the online course that you can find under the training section again all of this is rooted in physiology positive psychology neuroscience really tactical research-backed ways to help kind of improve your mental health and resilience on an ongoing basis and then if you're a sales leader listening then Something that I've been delivering to sales teams over the last, I guess it's what, six, 14, 16 months is a five week program that's focused on all of these different strategies to help sort of equipping sales teams as a group, start with sort of weekly discussions around different strategies and tactics you can be using as a team and going through it together. So that'd be another thing to check out under the training section is the, is the five week program I deliver. Thanks Jeff. I think that's incredibly helpful. And I have a feeling that, you know, this conversation would go on for a really long time. But in the interest of time, um, just curious. So what may be the number one impact that you would want to have in the world? Yeah, like I, I, I kind of, I, I, can't, I can't claim this one for myself, but because I think Dr. Andrew Huberman, he's a neuroscientist. I, I, I love his miss it mission and he's got a really great podcast called The Huberman Lab that kind of talks about this, but he's on a real, real mission to be like, the, the focus on making neuroscience more mainstream. So everybody is being given the tools that they need to help manage their stress levels on an ongoing basis. And I think that's really, really important because we're in this world where everyone is operating in this highly reactive and this highly fight or flight state. Social media, media is polarizing people more and more every single day. And a lot of it has to do, comes down to the fact that the vast majority of people don't know how to regulate their stress levels on an ongoing basis. And the more we can start, you know, embracing this conversation, prioritizing our mental health, we can start bringing more empathy and more compassion into the world. And that's really kind of what I like to kind of believe in and, and focus on within, within sales. It's like really target targeting the revenue generating arm of an organization to help them become more compassionate, not only to themselves, but the external world around them. And hoping through this, that when sales teams start learning how to make, treat their employees better, Salespeople become more empathetic, more curious about their emotions, curious to the impact they're having on the world. We can start also kind of tackling companies will start taking more of an active step involved with, you know, helping climate change, helping creating more diverse and inclusive, inclusive worlds and stop focusing so much on this profits over people mentality that is just like totally disruptive, disruptive. But I go on for this stuff, (laughs) go off on this stuff for a while, but I'm hoping that, you know, once leaders and organizations start be learning how to become more compassionate and empathetic internally 
hoping that through this work, they can start treating the external world better when they start to see the benefits internally to this stuff. I think that's super powerful to kind of, you know, remember that it's not only, you know, where we are feeling on the spectrum, but also the fact that there are these tools and there is neuroscience available to kind of help us navigate all of these things through life, right? I think that's sort of what is useful for everyone to keep in mind, that there is a way to get better at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, there is a way to get better at it, but you have to approach it from the same mindset that you would approach getting physically fit at the gym. You don't, you don't get improvements by going to the gym once or doing some push-ups, and you're like, I'm all of a sudden fit. It's like, it takes Damn that. Damn it, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it takes that consistent daily effort, discipline, habits and routines and work to make measurable change in this stuff. So if you want those that happier life, you want to be able to sleep better, you want to achieve all of your career goals, you want to have a more meaningful life, like it really requires that daily practice. It just doesn't come naturally through a magic pill. So hopefully that helps. I think it does, Jeff. Thanks so much. And I hope for everyone who's listening to this podcast, I think, you know, hopefully it's a, either a starting point or kind of, you know, something cheering them on um, in their own journey towards better mental health. Yeah, for sure. hope so too. Hopefully this helps somebody and, and kind of helps them change their perspective just a little bit. Thanks so much for joining me, Jeff. This was an incredible conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kishal. I appreciate it.